Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is May 31st, 3 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Yes, it's me. Do not be alarmed. Is that better? <laughs> I see Detroit Dave Underdown. Yeah, all right. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Wow, it's been an incredible ride over the weekend. Um, I'm, I'm talking about not a ride in a spacecraft or a, an earthbound vehicle or a motorcycle, but a journey of exploration, creative, intellectual, historical exploration. And I'm going to share with you today, dear friends and neighbors, some of my preliminary findings. And I say preliminary because... These talks are not meant to be definitive. It's These talks are more like a, a probe, if you will, in my mind, in my creative process, how I come about with insights. My definitive statements are in books. That's what books are meant to be, uh, at least for the most, at least the way I do it. It's to memorialize a series of observations or findings, and you have to support them to the best of your ability. And they are also subject to revision even though some uh, science uh, or empiricists or maybe even people of um, creative bent and novels think, think it's written in stone. This is it. This is definitive. No, 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 no. And I'm saying this because this is one of the chief conceits of people like Isaac Asimov and his peers, such as Robert Heinlein. And well, Heinlein is a different case. But his peers like uh, L. Ron Hubbard, these are names that you probably already know. And I'm going to be trying to tie them in together here in a more comprehensive, totalizing fashion than you are, are aware of, right? Because I'm going to be adding a lot of original insights that's going to be expanding our understanding of this genre. And this is what I'm alluding to when I when I say in my description here, the post-war American literary movement, that's what I mean, science fiction. I didn't use the term science fiction in the description because people always default to a certain preconceived notion. And that's one of my big bugbears is don't try to put anybody in a category prematurely or think that you have arrived at some sort of uh, definitive no knowledge or understanding the been there, you know, done that syndrome. Oh yeah, I got that. I got that. That's my chief um, complaint about the commentariat, right? The people who uh, lecture me, the expert on cultural forensics on what I need to do and why your autistic imagination can't really handle some of my uh, improvisations, right? And I, I'm not trying to um, stigmatize people who have autism, but uh, I just mentioned that because our brain, our neurological system has been systematically rewired over the past 70 years, 80 years. And I think this is part of the process that unintended or not, that people like Isaac Asimov have um, cultivated or even they, they laid the groundwork or the foundation. And you can see in the description of this talk here, I write down the intellectual foundation. And of course, that is an al allusion to the foundation trilogy. And now there's what, five, six, seven total attributed to Isomov. Isomov, I'm sorry, Asimov probably wrote the first three. The other ones might have been ghostwritten because this guy incredibly productive. No one person can write 500 books in his or her a lifetime unless they have a lot of editorial help. And I suspect even this first volume, this is the book, it's called Foundation. See, it's kind of a literary illusion. I like to play with um, puns and words and whatnot. So does Asimov. So do most people who, who write literature fiction and even scientists. They have a whimsy, a whimsical nature uh, that I have observed, and I am of that ilk. Uh, foundation, I'm sure he had help here, not only with the science, the basic science, but also the the literary style, because I read a lot of his nonfiction work, and he's a very straightforward, he's an excellent essayist, nonfiction essayist, and that is attested 
by the fact that I don't know if you could say he was a best-selling author, but he sold, I don't know, untold thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of books on popular science. That was his greatest contribution to, or maybe a negative contribution to, American society and the world of technology, exploration, science, and, and whatnot. And that is attested to the fact, and it's not just me saying that. I was just looking in my library before coming on live with you, fine people here today. I hope you're having a, a wonderful uh, extended Memorial Day holiday. Um, but I pulled this book down off the shelf. It's called um, Engines of Creation. It's like a fairly old by now, but still very relevant to our, our needs. And it's out of print. I had to buy it used. I think it was published in 1985, uh, 87. Okay. And it's, um, the Ford is by Marvin Minsky, right? Not the burlesque King Mar, you know, the, the night they raided Minsky's, but the MIT physicist, Marvin Minsky. He's, by the way, the person who is, it's not just one person, but usually the person who is pointed to as being the, quote, an inventor of AI, artificial intelligence. He might have been one of the first people to use that term, but he certainly wasn't the first person to come up with that idea. A lot of these old ideas, as we're going to be talking about today, go back 300 years, 500 years. I'd say around the at least, well, you can go back to the Sumerians if you like, but in the modern period, or and I consider the 17th century modern, by the way, uh, in the modern period, I would have to go back to the age of Elizabeth I, where the real science takeoff, as we know it, began. And of course, it has a uh, hand in glove relationship to the occult and metaphysics. And this is something that Asimov lacks, Asimov and his ilk. And um, well, well, before I get off, um, off track there, let me finished unpacking what I meant by my description here. So the point is, is that Asimov, when I say Asimov, him and his offshoots, his imitators, his wannabes, right? They have entranced, I didn't use the term entrained, but if entranced, like, right, you're in a trance, it's like a hex, it's a curse. It's uh, voodoo, it's juju, it's uh, hypnotism. And we're going to talk about hypnotism. We're going to talk about mind control, yes, they have entranced this every generation that followed them, right? From the 50s to the 60s and 70s. I don't know, that's like three or four generations. If you go every 20 years, it's a new generation. So maybe five, six, seven years, uh, seven generations of biotechnocrats. And we know what technocrats are. I don't have to expand on that. Uh, I just depend these prefix bio because everything is bio now. It's bio tyranny. There's a biocracy that is attempting to stage a silent coup on the human population. And I think a lot of them were probably Asimov freaks in their youth, or probably maybe they still go back to reading the foundation in their dotage. Maybe Klaus Schwab himself has a, has a uh, leather-bound special edition of, of the, the foundation trilogy because... Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of this material here is quite prescient, right? Now, David Icke, as good, great as he is, uh, he calls it predictive programming. That's that's fine and dandy. That's usually the term that most people use currently. It has a great deal of uh, play amongst people who are interested in alternative research and uh, conspiracy theory and, and uh, similar Pursuit. So if you want to stay with uh, predictive programming, that's fine. But Asimov had something, and again, it's not original to Asimov either, but Asimov laid claim to a term that he claims as his own. He calls it psychohistory. All right. And I'm not going to get to a total nerd out unpacking of what he meant by psychohistory, because believe me, I've looked at it and I haven't even scratched the surface. There is a huge body of literature on glosses on Asimov's psychohistory. Usually these are people in literary studies. Some of them are people from the sciences. In addition to that, some the reason I mention this is because some people might mistake 
Asimov's use of psychohistory with another use of psycho, the same term, psychohistory, and that is biographers who like to look at certain major historical figures, say Adolf Hitler, or maybe a movie star, a celebrity, a Marilyn Monroe, and they like to do an ex post facto, that's after the fact, analysis on world historical figure A, B, or C by applying psychoanalytic techniques. So it's really a, p a piece, uh, for the most part, in, in my estimation, a imputation of certain characteristics that are given by the, the author, the explicator. I forgot the guy's name, but this was an early example of it. I think he was OSS, by the way. He was asked by the OSS to come up with a psychological profile of Adolf Hitler during the war, during World War II. When I say the, the war, <laughs> I, I, I guess I should clarify, we're not talking about the, uh, the, the war amongst the foundation people. I'm talking about the World, world War II is usually what we mean. Because that was the real big divide. Some people say it was World War One or the Great War. If one of you um, quibblers, nitpickers, would rather rather have me say Great War, okay, good, Great War. But World War Two is what I what I'm alluding to in shorthand fashion, because that's the the turning point, the historical turning point where most of these men came. Well, all of them that I'm going to be talking about. There was really the formative influence on their worldview. And of course, by extension, their fiction and their influence, right? This pivotal moment, World War II for the U.S., 1941 to 45, for Europe, 1939 to 1945. And as most of you know, World War II never really ended. I don't really even have to explain what I mean by that. Okay, I should tell you that my, and by the way, I this is the first serious attempt for me to, I mean, I've read Asimov's short stories and his essays, but this is the first attempt on my part to read the trilogy, the Foundation trilogy, from the perspective that I have developed over the decades. And I'm glad that I'm, re just like a, a, an analogy in my own recent talks is when I undertook rereading not rereading, I'm saying it's almost like it's brand new to me, but reading the entire 007 novels by one Ian Fleming. I did that. I ordered them all, right? Fortunately, these are back in print in, in uh, they're not revised, but they're new uniform editions because Apple TV Plus has a series, and this is why this talk here is really timely, has a new series that they are promoting heavily. I'll show you the uh, the promo in a moment, right? But I wanted to give this extended introduction to you to answer certain questions that you might have lingering in your mind before we tackle the topic itself. But I reread the entire 007 Ian Fleming work because I wanted to understand the nature of 007's and Ian Fleming's, the nature of British Empire and their long-term goals. And I got, if you want to look at my two-parter, series. I think it's under my other channel because I think it was in a, I had been suspended by TubeU at the time. So if you want to look under Daryl Y. Hamamoto, PhD, I think there's a two part or it might be in the Professor Hamamoto channel, but it's there. It's for the ages. It's There's a video there. Watch those too. So I'm doing the same for Isaac Asimov, reading the trilogy. And now I think I'm going to read all five, six or seven of them to see how the, he, he completes the circle. Uh, before I go on, let me and, and bore you with this extended uh, introduction. Let me give you an idea of where contemporary media mavens or the media. Let's see, where is this? Yeah, I'm going to give you an idea of where the Apple people are taking us. Let's see. Only Here we go. Short of the darkness. People have been trying to make Foundation for over 50 years. Foundation was an enormous influence for Star Wars. It was the greatest science fiction work of all time. The story is sprawling, the scope is sprawling, it unfolds over the course of a thousand years. <laughs> 
If ever there were a company that was hoping to sort of better people's lives through technology, through connectivity, it's Apple. And that's something very much that Asimov was hoping to do. going to arrest me tomorrow. And you. It's almost a certainty. My work, psychohistory? Yes, in theory, but I don't know what it has to do. It's not a theory. They're worried you can predict the future. They're worried people believe I can. <laughs> I don't like the future I predict. The Empire will fall. Order will vanish. There's massive events rushing to meet us. Only we can shorten the darkness. Oh, yes, the future begins, according to Apple. Right, so the older gentleman in this preview is Hari Seldon. And for those who don't know, Hari Seldon is the, in, in the books, is the innovator, the inventor of psychohistory. And through the use of mathematics, he's able to forecast thousands of years into the future Uh how civilizations are going to evolve or decline or devolve or how they're going to disappear. And it's interesting. He defines himself as a psychologist, a behavioral scientist, a socio social scientist, right? Not as a physicist, but he's using mathematical formula as uh, the basis of his new science of psychohistory. So he's about to be arrested. He's about to go off the historical stage, but he's passing the torch over to uh, Gael. That's the woman there. Um, she or he, in the book, it's a he. He's the uh, chief uh, editor or writer for what's called Encyclopedia Galactica. And the name is Gaal Dornick. Right. By the way, they put a woman of color there because, and this uh, series here is only a couple of years old. They put a woman of color there, I'm pretty sure, because uh, there was a woman from Hong Kong who won the John W. Kent. He's the mastermind of all this uh, literature, this literary movement I call science fiction. Um, and he was the mentor to, to, um, Isaac Asimov, as I'll get to him in a moment. But I just want to explain why there's a woman of color there. She's probably lesbian, too, to be LGBTQ correct, right? Uh, there's a woman named uh, Jeanette Ng from Hong Kong. She's a Hong Konger who called out the science fiction establishment. She won the John W. Campbell Award. She called them out for being primarily male, racist, fascistic, uh, totalitarian, and... Um, uh, I don't know. She said they were homophobic. She threw out everything at them while, when she got the award. So subsequently, they changed the name of the award. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's called the Political Correct Award. But it's no longer the John W. Campbell. And by the way, he did have those uh, tendencies, which I'll uh, talk about in a moment. And on a personal note, uh, one of the reasons why I never read science fiction, especially of this vintage of World War II vintage, is because I have the face of the uh, Jap enemy, right? These are all anti-Jap people. And I'm Japanese-American, third generation. My father was in the U.S. military, veterans of the foreign war. So I grew up in the post-war period uh, reading this type of material and seeing it on the movies and seeing it on television and uh, having to trying to figure out and understand wh wh where's all this hate coming from, right? And by the way, I later, um, as an academic, wrote a book on it. This is called Monitored Peril, right? Uh, this is me up there, and the subtitle is Asian Americans and the Politics of TV Representation, right? 
I ask questions and I write about them, right? I'm asking questions about where we're going in 2022 as a species, because it's not all about ethnicity and race as the critical race theorists, theorists would have us believe, right? And I, this book was one of the formative texts of CRT, by the way, it's, it's still cited today, but I repudiate everything that CRT stands for today because it's been hijacked. Uh, just like Isaac Asimov and, and some of these other characters hijacked the sciences in order to create, and I agree with Jeanette Ng here, a techno-totalitarian biotechnocratic, if you will, state, a, a biofascist state that has its headquarters in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, or maybe, you know, when NATO headquarters, you, you pick your globalist town. And it has its financial centers, as we've talked about before, whether it's uh, New York City, right, uh, Wall Street, or the city of London. Now, I'm talking about banking because banking, again, looms very large in this world view here. And it's a world view that is cross cultural, timeless, and universal. Because as a species, we are dependent upon production, right? Reproduction and production. Production means economy. So that means resources. That means the competition for resources. That means populations. That means, oh, conquering populations or valorizing other ones, supporting them, right? Sound very familiar? We're going through one of these pivotal moments in human society right now. And if you're going to take the Apple TV version of it, you're going to look to the Foundation tri Trilogy, Isaac Asimov, for answers, right? This is the 12 or 13-year-old kids who are watching this new revised version or iteration, let's say, of the Foundation uh, mythos, and uh, they're going to absorb it. And that's going to take us another 20 years down and down this uh, primrose path, right? Where we're, uh, if we're not extinct by then, thanks to uh, the people in the World Horror Organization, the WHO, the United Nations, then they're going to take it a the agenda a little bit further. And that's why this talk is so important. It um, It's really relevant to what's going on in Davos. Maybe that conclave is, is over by now, but uh, its impact will be seen for weeks, months, and maybe even years to come, unless, ladies and gentlemen, here's the good news, unless we come up with our counter narratives, our counter stories, our counter fiction, our counter culture, our counter music, our counter mojo, right? Counter, 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 counter. And that's been the, the, uh, the real strength of the arts through the ages, the bards, right? The oral tradition, the riddles, the jokes, the humorous, the spoken word people taking down pretension, even of kings and princes, right? Playing the fool, having the carnival where these roles are inverted. The king becomes a fool for one day or for a solid week, right? Shrove Tuesday, carnivalesque. Right, that has always been the function of the jester to tell the truth to the king without being beheaded. So, ladies and gentlemen, fellow fools, fellow jesters, we have a function here that we must fulfill, and that's what we're going to do here from here on out. Well, <laughs> we've been doing it for a long time. They just haven't taken notice, and they haven't been able to shut us all down. They might have sent some GLBTQ. Uh, terrorists on the stage to threaten David Chappelle, right? Because he made a joke about transvestites or transsexuals, but that's going to not going to really have any lasting effect. Dave, Dave Chappelle is going to come back even stronger and with a bigger game than what he already has. Okay, that's just one example of what I'm talking about so far as the uh, subversive, uh, politically subversive function of humor, right? And the Riddler. That's Robin Williams. That's why they, uh, they, the neuroscientist, took over his brain and filled it with Lewy body disease. They had to hijack his brain. And we're going to talk about neuroscience in a moment. I keep promising you because these characters were experimenting with it directly, including Isaac Asimov. Right? We know, by the way, that uh, Isaac Asimov was a instructor. I don't know if he's a professor, but he he taught biochemistry at uh, Boston University. 
1949. He got his PhD at uh, Columbia University. That's probably when he first started adopting the royalist perspective, right? The, the Knights Templar banking perspective of his masters under the guise of physics, which really comes from the, uh, the, the research of, um, your people like Francis Bacon and Newton and all the other great minds that, that came from that part of the world later in the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire and later throughout the entire world. Now that the, the center point has moved more towards China, Japan and uh, the in, in the Indian subcontinent as well, so far as intellectual prominence is concerned. Right. But the end game is always the same power, control. Uh, manipulation on a more crass level. That's what it's all about. That's what the foundation is all about. But if you approach it through the Asmovian method, that is with a total, almost complete, I won't say total, but the almost complete lack of humanity, then we're in for trouble. All right. His world is a technocratic world of art of devoid of heart and soul and humanity of flesh and blood. There's no love. There's no sentiment in the foundation. I've only read the first one. I'm going to be reading the second one, and I've already cheated and delved into the volume three, right? Um, but there's no there's no blood in it. It's lifelessness. It's the cold, cold equations, if I may uh, echo a formative uh, short story in the science fiction movement right and it's more than a genre by the way it is i i consider it a full blown literary movement just like uh noir right noir fiction dashiell hammett and uh raymond chandler and and all their imitators are the people that came subsequently right or the romance novels uh vc andrews and you know it's it's a it's a movement and it's a really strong to to this very day political scientific bio movement that we're grappling with right now. Okay. So the reason I mentioned his academic roots is that's one of the reasons why he, he had such um, standing within not just the publishing field, but also within the larger society. And indeed he was writing science fiction as an avocation. He was writing it uh, because it paid well, that fiction doesn't pay anything making music, Right. If you're a professional, that doesn't pay anything today, anything creative. It's all been taken over by Apple. Right. Apple TV, Apple Music. I'm saying Apple is being a shorthand for the entire online universe, which has captured creativity and commodified it and monetize it for their own use. But we're not done yet, ladies and gentlemen. So he wrote science fiction on the side when it paid you know, a, a penny a word or whatever it might be. They paid by the word back then. And remember, there was no television. Well, there was television. There wasn't widespread television. Radio was the chief medium at the time. There was less competition for the printed word. That's what I'm I'm trying to state here. People read, in other words, they read magazines, they read comic books, they read uh, highbrow journals, right? They read aspirational magazines like the New Yorker, right? Um, of course, the specialized people re read the academic journals. That's where uh, Robert Maxwell comes in with Splinga Verlag. He, he got his uh, end in there by monopolizing the post-war academic publishing and selling off that asset to the highest bidders, right? So the printed word was always, has and remains key to, uh, to to human civilization, contrary to all you phone heads out there. And by the way, I'm not against technology. I am not uh, technophobic or whatever you want to call it. Just because I uh, avoid uh, Twitter, I don't want to be part of the Twitter. I do use Facebook, and obviously I'm I'm here on uh, on TubeU, right? So I'm not technophobic as as such. Uh, I am, however, anti biofascism. And uh, don't want to, and I'm trying to take as much many steps as possible to to avoid falling into that trap. So the foundation published in 19 
51. Oh my gosh, this is even before I was born. That's how old it was. And then in rapid succession, I think year after like 52, there came a second volume and the third of the trilogy was published in 53. That's the second foundation, right? And I'm not going, because there's tons of material on on Tuba U to go through the plot lines of Asimov and the Founts. So I'm not going to repeat all that. So I looked at some of it, said, well, this is what I'm not going to talk about because I don't want to waste the precious time of people here, I'm gonna, which allows me to get right at to right at the heart of, of what these this literature or the literary movement really means in the larger scheme of things here. Okay, note that as a uh, academic, Asimov was turned to by, I guess, policymakers, politicians, perhaps even elective officials, high level intellectuals, physicists. I'm sure he talked to some of the big boys that were involved either tangentially or immediately with uh, Los Alamos. I'm suspecting we don't know and maybe we'll never know because he was sworn to secrecy as a participant in these top secret projects, which I'll get, let me, um, let me just talk about it right now, very quickly. I'll just show you a picture so you know what I'm talking about. That is uh, Isaac Asimov on the right, right? The famous writer. And that is, uh, do you see the arrow there? That is, um, well, that is uh, L. Sprague, Sprague de, de Camp, I believe. And this is Robert Heinlein, or maybe I got it reversed. But these are three major figures in science fiction, okay? And this is that was taken in 1944. Uh, I don't think uh, Asimov ever had a military co commission, and I don't think uh, Heinlein. No, I think Heinlein did. In fact, he uh, Heinlein is is an interesting case. He remained an American patriot all the way to the end. I mentioned this because he's been disparaged as a as a fascist, as an elitist. And by the way, that's why I never read Heinlein for a long time, just like I never read LaRouche because there was this whole def and I never read Ezra Pound or Eustace Mullins because there was a whole defamation campaign against these people saying, if you read them, then you are a fascist. You were also a totalitarian. And I found out later, much later, that these guys were really on top of what the new world or what today is called the new world order, what it represents and the threat of it. And then their, their critique was spot on. So again, I warn you from personal experience, never to take the word of the ideologues out there. Never take the words of the people, you know, I call it the Annie Jacobson syndrome. You read the books and, oh yeah, okay, this is it. Uh, you, no no more, nothing to look at here. It's all in the book here. That's all you have to look, look at, right? So again, I was tricked and only belatedly started to, well, I appreciated them. I'll tell you how I, how I uh, came into, um, uh, if, if you'll allow me, if you will indulge me a little bit of autobiographical reminiscence, all right? That's also what I do here on the Professor Hamamoto channel. You got it? It's named after me. It's about my life. It's about my research. It's about my direct involvement in the issues that I'm dealing with right here. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting excited. <coughs> I have to soothe my throat. You see, I don't have much human contact. You know, I'm not teaching anymore. So my voice is not as conditioned and, and, and speaking is a physical act. Lecturing is a physical act. It's not just an intellectual act. You have to do it constantly. It's like a singer, a performer, an actor. You have to exercise the vocal cords every day in a systematic fashion or to keep, I'm just telling you why I'm choking, like usually halfway or by the end of the 60 minutes, I'm, my vocal cords are, are starting to um, uh, fail me. I think I should start singing uh, more again and um, spend maybe about 30 to 40 minutes uh, playing tunes, which I like doing anyway, but doing it regularly to, to build myself up uh, physically. All right. Enough for that, for that digression. This is how I became acquainted 
too. And this is, again, a little bit of advice on how to overcome your prejudices, because I had a prejudice against science fiction, as I told you, because it was anti-Asian, primarily it was anti-Japanese, right? Ling the Merciless and all these scientists, you know, Dr. Fu Manchu and all that. So um, my father, who would watch all this stuff, would bristle. He's a U.S. veteran. He's a veteran of the, of the U.S. military. He fought for the United States of America. Right. He put his life on the line. Then. And I told you already, he's a VFW and he's really pissed off that, that all this garbage was on there. And he, he uh, taught um, myself. I observe this very often. says, that's not who we are and that's not who you are. And don't you ever forget it. Right. So um, that's why I did not look at these characters, because if you read even the foundation, you read the foundation here. The head of the galaxy is is a Chinaman, right? Or as Alex Jones liked to call him, a Chaka. And um, one of the emergent societies here is Japan. This is in 1951. Japan was was still occupied by the U.S., but I think Asimov already had contacts with the U.S. State Department saying, hey, we're going to rebuild Japan as a manufacturing dynamo, and we're going to use Japan as an outpost of American capitalism in East Asia to blunt the communist threat over in China, which we're also going to encourage so that we'll have an enemy to fight for decades and decades. And we even have our man picked out already. His name is Mao Zedong, and he's already been identified and recruited from Yale in China. Right, we're going to make him the supreme leader of the that particular planetary orbit. Right, this is all workshop way ahead of time. So it took me years later to overcome my prejudice about their prejudice, and dare I say, racism. And it was not until I went to Bowling Green State University in Bowling Green, Ohio, in nineteen late nineteen seventy five, the fall of seventy five through 1976. And guess what? In my very first paper I wrote there, this is for my master's degree. I've been at this for a long time, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not a newbie in popular culture. I have a master's degree in popular culture. And I was just looking at my papers today. And I said, I'm how to, let me bring this into today's discussion. It's dated fall 1975. This was done on an electric typewriter. There was no word processors, processors back then. This is the original TypeScript with all the different, oh, you wouldn't know what it is, white out, right? Or the little erasures. <laughs> oh, man. I think I'm going to scan this. I'm going to put this on my Patreon site for my Patreon supporters. You want to read this? This is a real pression piece of scholarship, if I can call it that. It's 21 pages. And guess what the topic is? Popular culture in Japan. Yes. 1975. This is before Japan went from being the reviled enemy, gal galactic enemy, a la Al Sprague de Camp and uh, uh, Isaac Asimov, and especially Robert Campbell, he hated Asians. He hated Japanese people. Uh, he was indeed a racist. I know the term is uh, is overused, but uh, this we're talking about World War II now, right? People were pissed off. Pearl Harbor and all that, although my parents are living in Hawaii, they're the ones who got bombed because they're Japanese Americans. You understand? There is a difference there. Right there, they, I told you the story already. Right? How my mother was given a gas mask to take to high school every day. This is during after the bombing of of Pearl Harbor, right? Uh, but they didn't care. We were all of the same enemy uh, race here, right? So I overcame it um, in uh, at Bowling Green when I took a course in popular genres, and we we studied the western. And then there was a huge section on science fiction done. I think it was taught by Professor Michael Marsden. He was really good. Uh, of course, they weren't talking about the politics of it. They were more like being apologetic about it. This is 1975. Real, you understand where if you read science fiction, you weren't taken seriously. Now it's taught at the university. There's books and it's it's considered a legitimate uh Genre. I say it's more than a genre. It is a literary movement. I don't see anybody in literary studies going so far as to call it a movement. At least as important or maybe even more important than Bloomsbury, the Bloomsbury group, right? There's all these different, you know, modernists, right? The Hemingway, Fitzgerald, these were spoken about in reverential terms. And I 
agree with that. I don't disagree. But the impact on the larger bio-fascist society of today, 19, uh, 2022, that's the, that, that's the contribution, the perverse contribution of these guys right here, right? So I've been at it. And um, as we know, the, the uh, generation today, they fetishize Japan. And, and that's also a mistake because Japan was appointed by people in Asimov circuit, uh, circle rather early on as being the nanotechnology uh, and AI center, research center, and the rollout place, uh, uh, geographic location for this new stage in humanity that the futurists have been predicting for us. That's why they have not really been attacking Japan very um, very thoroughly as other parts of the world. Africa has been hit, right? It, it depends on where you are in the world and what your role is in the new world order uh, so far as the recent attacks are concerned. Japan has been with with an occasional reminder who's in who's in charge who's the boss like uh, fukushima said oh you, you're getting a little bit too independent let's, let's, let's how about us giving you a, a tsunami here and having you go through a, a, a meltdown up there right now getting back to asimov here i might have to make this two-parter ladies and gentlemen getting back to asimov's contribution in by 1967 he was already isaac asimov the guy with the mutton chop sideburns and Everybody worse, not except for me, by the way. I boycotted him, uh, as you as you recall. <laughs> uh, but he was already at the top of his game. So, and he had, he attended a conference, I think, in the 62, 63. I can't remember. This, by the way, this information I'm getting from a really good recent book. It's called Astounding, John W. Campbell, Isaac Asimov, Heinlein, Hubbard, The Golden Age of Science Fiction, right? For over 400 pages. Excellent book. So I'm drawing, I'm going to give this author credit. His name's Alec Navala Lee for synthesizing this. Of course, he doesn't go as far as I do, and he doesn't have the same perspective, but he's providing the biographical information that, that we need to understand in order to contextualize Isaac Asimov as being part of this new biofascist regime that we're seeing today. So he was already popular. He was um, brought to a conference, I think at Yale or one of the, elite schools about the future of technology, where we're heading, one of these uh, workshops, right? I've been to many of those myself as an invited guest. I'm a media expert, remember? And they were trying to get to me so that I could be a promoter of the GLBTQ agenda, and I refused to do it. Um, that's another talk altogether. This was done through the Annenberg School of Communications down at USC. They've got tons of money, black money, they got a black budget to do all the social and cultural engineering, and they need people like Asimov. I'm not saying I'm Asimov, but I'm saying such as myself. I'm, I understand the grooming and the recruitment process, elite recruitment, because I've been through it. All right. Uh, that's how, how I'm, I understand this movement so well, better than most. Anyway, he was invited to one of these events, and as a result, the editor's at the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, there is such a publication. It's still in his existence. They asked him to comment about the future of atomic energy and atomic weapons. And he wrote an essay in 1967 titled The Sword of Achilles, right, as in, of the mythological Achilles. I don't need to review that. But the point is, is that in that essay, Asimov said, we should you, we being the science dictatorship, the technocracy, the biotechnocracy, we should, the imperial we, should use science fiction as a way to identify the best and brightest minds who are going to bring in this new future technocratic, I call it biotechnocratic society. I call it a biotechnocratic dictatorship, a tyranny. Right. He saw liberation. I see nothing but slavery and misery, except for the super elite who are never going to get there anyway. They're going to be turned on. They're going to be rolled over uh, in time. Right. Isaac, you know, the, one of the founders of it himself, John Campbell, who I should talk about before we sign off today. He I outlived him already. He was a two pack a day smoker. He died at age 61. He was the guy that discovered, quote unquote, Isaac Asimov when Isaac Asimov was still a teeny bopper. 
I don't think it was an accident, by the way. I don't think Asimov just walked into the editorial office of uh, Analog, a magazine. I don't know what it was called back then, but he was the editor, John Campbell. I don't think it was an accident. I think it was a setup, but that's the legend that we're, we're told in books like this. I think they were matched. They say, hey, there's a bright really brilliant young man there. His name is Isaac Asimov, and he really wants to become a mainstream uh, author and break through. I think you could use him. And Campbell said, great. That sounds like myself, right? So he wrote this sort of Achilles essay telling the uh, science dictatorship how they're going to identify people, and more importantly, how they're going to groom them and sustain them, right? So by the time you have books such as this, the engines of creation, the coming era of nanotechnology, this guy here can talk about Asimov's influence on creating this new generation. I'll read here. says, although many scientists and technologists have tried to do this, isn't it curious that the most successful attempts were those science fiction writers like Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, Frederick Pohl, Robert Heinlein, Isaac Asimov, and Arthur C. Clarke? Right. These are where people like Marvin Minsky... That's where they got the right people like um, uh, in the social sciences. What's that guy? Paul Krugman, the guy that writes for uh, the New York Times, a New Yorker, one of the establishment publications. He's an economist by training, but he grew up reading Asimov. He probably adopted the whole premises behind Harry Seldon's uh, psychohistory. So people read him today as a forecaster of of the coming economy, whether it's next month or 10 years down the road. That, that's uh, Paul Krugman, I'm sorry. And didn't he win the Nobel Prize too? So this is not trivial. This is not trivial information here. It's not just a, a little uh, an exercise in um, nostalgia for me going back to Bowling Green State University. This is very 2022. So notice the recruitment strategy. We're going to use science fiction. Do you see any parallels with what they're doing with the video games? Right. They want to find autistic young men right before the age of 12. That's when they have their peak, uh, their peak, peak moment of receptivity and and uh, uh, openness, let's call it, to this uh, a certain worldview. And that, that by the way, is why uh, in the English uh, public school boarding system, why they like to sodomize boys before they go into puberty. They want to penetrate them spiritually, psychically with the demonic forces so that they can be in control over the intelligence operations for the entire, uh, the rest of their lives. So age 12, and this is what I got from this book here. That's the golden age uh, for most people who are in science fiction or in video games. So it's not so much science fiction anymore. It's crossed over exclusively. It's crossed over into, as we see film, but mo more than that, video games. So I think that's where that's where they're gathering. They meaning um, uh, PayPal and uh, Paul Thiel or, or uh, Peter Thiel and, and um, uh, other, all these other techno oligarchs of uh, of DARPA Valley are gathering a lot of data on the users of of this type of quote unquote entertainment. All right. So let me go a little bit into uh, John W. Campbell. It's no longer called the Campbell Award anymore, thanks to Jeanette Ng, who called him out. And she won the award of, for the best sign. I have her, her novel. I haven't read it yet because I, I got to check who this person out, man. She's, she's, a, she's a world destroyer. And by the way, I use her as an example how one person can, and I don't believe in censorship. I, I think they should have left it the, uh, left the name up there. John, it should be the John W. Campbell Award. And I think all the statues that these people are telling uh, the administration to tear down, I think they should stay up there because it's a reminder of, um, of our, our past that most of us have repudiated, right? So anyway, I'm mixed on that, what uh, Ng's contr mixed contribution there. But anyway, what is his family history? Very interesting. His father... Talk about John Campbell, uh, W. Campbell Jr. His father was an executive, a manager, high level at Bell Telephone in New Jersey. That's why I guess he was born in New Jersey himself in 1912. And later on, when it became AT&T, this is one of the early globalist companies, right? It's telephone. This is his dad worked for it. So Campbell and his 
you know, you can read the uh, biography here by Alec and Navala Lee. His family, as a result, uh, came from a relative. Uh, I mean, they were relatively well positioned, uh, both intellectually, uh, professionally, and um, and uh, academically, because uh, Campbell himself, John Campbell Jr. himself was told by his father, the AT&T executive, that he'd pay his way through MIT. This is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It is not Stanford M made in Taiwan, as we like to joke, because most of the students there are from Taiwan. Now they're from China. Uh, before it was people like, uh, you know, um, uh, John Campbell. Okay. Now he never finished. So he's a someone who experienced uh, a heartbreaking setback early on in his career, same like same as myself, although it didn't happen to me until after I got my doctorate, right? That's another story. Uh, in retrospect, though, it, it was good for me. It, it, it taught me that I, I should never really uh, subscribe to any of the uh, the offers that these people hand to you in, in order to seduce you into doing their bidding, bidding right? So what's interesting about MIT, and this now it makes sense to me, because psychohistory is about predicting the future using mathematics, algorithms, and mathematical modeling, sophisticated and computation in order to predict human evolution, society, and really engineer history in the same process. So where did that idea come from? It didn't come from Asimov. It came from Campbell, and now I figured out where it came because I said, "My gosh, I knew this. I could read it." And I, I said, "This sounds asthma. This is not original asthma. It comes from Norbert Wiener." And sure enough, guess who Campbell studied with at MIT? Norbert Wiener, the physicist. Norbert Wiener is the just like Minsky, supposedly the father of uh, AI. Norbert Wiener coined the term cybernetics, right? He's a physicist. And he was also talking about future society being run by a, a cadre, a select group of technocrats, or today it's biotechnocrats, people like Dr. Robert Malone or, or um, in, in the medical sciences and uh, people in the social behavioral, they're going to be, they're going to be the ones who are the cybernaut, the cyberneticists. That was Norbert. So it really comes from cybernetics, really, that from MIT, that Norbert, who was a Nobel Prize winner, by the way, Norbert, and he also worked on the space program as well. So this is, and by the way, Norbert Wiener was the only professor that took Campbell seriously as a science fiction writer, because, because Campbell, even at, at that young age, was writing pulp fiction for Hugh, uh, Hugo Gernsbach, who deserves another talk uh, unto himself. And he comes from what was then the remnants of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. There's a lot of Habsburg-type wrangling in the intellectual world here going on in order to setting the stage for World War II, right? After going through World War I, Gernsbach comes out of that. But that, I'll get to that in a moment. Let me finish up with... Uh, with Campbell, and I'm going to return to him uh, later. Okay, here's my contribution with Campbell, right? Remember, I read the entire oeuvre of Ian Fleming, the 007 series, right? All of them. I don't know, what, 16, 17? No, I can't remember. I have them all. I read them all. I took copious notes from the perspective that I've developed. And I, by the end of the first or, or the last volume or the second last volume, I realized, this is from Fleming himself, that James Bond was a Scotsman. And that's why when he was recommended by, by M or Q, rather, or is it M or Q, by his boss over at MI, right, for a knighthood, James Bond turns it down. And I said, why did he turn it down? This is the question I'm asking myself. I said, of course, he, Fleming says he's a Scots. That means he already is a knight. He's a knight Templar. A Templar Knight. Look at my previous talk, by the way, if you want to 
know more about uh, the Knights Templar and forget about what you think you know about the Knights. This is one of those problems again. I have, it's been written about. I have uh, most of the books here. I've read them myself about the Knights Templar. Does that mean that that's all that there is to know about it? No, I'm giving you a connection right here. I think Campbell himself, that bloodline, the Campbell, that's a Scottish name, was a temple, Templar bloodline. And that's why his grandfather was a ma um, a judge because you had to be a Knights Templar. We usually call it Freemasonry, right? It's more Knights Templar than Freemasonry. This is another one of the examples of why people obsess on Freemasons, this, Freemasons, Freemasons. Okay, fine and dandy. I read most of that literature myself. I'm not a newbie, okay? I'm not an expert on it. I don't claim to be, but I'm not a monomaniac who's going to blame everything on the friggin' Freemasons. But I'm telling you here, when you hear Freemason, you have to think Knights Templar because that is the banking arm of this operation here. And the biotechnocracy is nothing but a banking sc uh, scam, a banking, a huge global banking. To call it a fraud is really uh, not giving it enough credit. I mean, there has to be. Let's work together like, on coming up with a new term beyond mega fraud. How's that? So if you don't, okay, you think, okay, Campbell, right? There's a lot of Campbells that are not all Templars. Okay, so how then, you skeptics, and I'm glad you're skeptical, how then do you account for the fact that while he was at MIT, right, John W. Campbell Jr., while he was at MIT, and while he was being tutored by people like Norbert Wiener, learning about the future cybernetic society, and he was for, for money and for fun, he was writing for the pulps, right? Why do you think his, his nom de plume, right? His uh, creative name, his writer's name was Stuart. Yes, he wrote as Don A. Stuart. He was writing science fiction as Don A. Stuart is a Scottish name. Stuart, are, some would argue today, are the legitimate heirs to the throne of Britain. Right. You know the history. Well, you know most of it. Right. The the usurpation and uh, Diana Spencer, by the way, was also of the Stuart line. That's one of the reasons why they brought her into the family. They mated her. They used her as a brood mare. This is what Diana Spencer said herself in order to further legitim legitimize the house of Sax Kohlberg und Gotha. Right. So he was a Campbell and a Stuart. So I think I think I'm suspecting this is for future researchers to figure out. Right. Um, Diamond Dave or Detroit Dave Underdown, here's an assignment for you because there's because uh, he went to private school in Michigan, the state of Michigan. I'm talking about Donald Campbell, uh, but ch check out the the uh, the Campbell, the John W. Campbell bloodlines, and that of his father and his grandfather, who was the judge, right? Who was probably a Templar or, or a Freemason, if you will. So you see how that lines up. This is not covered in Alec Navalli. That's fine. He can't cover it all. This is why. We read and, and discuss and compare notes and, and take the argument uh, further and further. So there you go. That's uh, And of course, if you're a Templar Knight and if you are a Campbell and if you come from that social class, you have an inherent class, social class bias that you're dealing with. And Campbell did indeed have that. And that's why Jeanette Ng called him out for it. But it wasn't so much race as, as it was this, this notion of election, right? This notion of being a cut above all humanity, whatever, even above other, quote unquote, white people who were not of that super caste, right? Which is now the bio technocracy. That's where Jeanette Ng doesn't, she's only understanding it through the the contemporary lens of uh, so-called critical race theory, right? So, you know, if, if I had a discussion with that, I would try, with her, I would try to unpack what she's talking about. But I'm glad she, uh, she was a disruptor in that way, because as you know, my strategy of bringing down the oligarchy is to always disrupt, disrupt, disrupt. It's the, uh, the smut process smudge smudge them it's the national Enquirer with all the dirt all the uh the smudginess is possible look at their biographies and you'll find weakness and work the weakness work the fissures and then that'll delay the final takeover right that's my strategy double barreled smut peddling that's me smut does not mean pornography it has three different meanings of biological smut right? Bacteria, 
right? That's a smut. There's there's the smutty literature, and the other smut is dirt, right? Oh, schmutz, as they say in German and in Yiddish, right? Okay. Um, let me conclude this talk today by saying that Asimov is just the, the tip of the iceberg without even having to go through Asimov or even citing him because he's part of the DNA of bio-oppression, bio-totalitarianism. Think tanks like the Rand Corporation issue reports on the future atomic-centered uh, atom, atomic energy centered and atomic weaponry, hyper weaponry, hyper weapons, uh, visions of the future, which sound like reading the foundation. This is today in 2022. And you have a ton of academic literature talking about um, the weaponization of outer space and the law journal. And I looked at a lot of it in preparing for this talk. The weaponization of outer space is a really common theme in the law journals, social sciences, the policy people, maybe even a little bit of literature. It's being argued strenuously in the academic world, right? That's why this is not just a little exercise in, in trivia, like some of the commentariat uh, like to imply. There's a lot at stake here, the future of humanity. I don't think that's an exaggeration. All right. Now, before I finish, I just want to clarify one misconception that I share. This is, again, when I criticize people who think they know it all, right, the, 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 uh, the nitpickers, as I call them, I include myself because I accepted the critique of Robert Heinlein as being a fascist, as being a right winger, uh, all of it. And I have those articles on file, too. And I didn't read them for the longest time. I read some of his books, but I really didn't take them seriously. And I certainly didn't want to be identified with Stranger in a Strange Land based on all the propaganda that was being put out against Robert Heinlein. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'll leave you with this. Only recently did I, me, myself, Professor Hamamoto, right, mea culpa, right? I'm guilty of, of, of these uh, foibles just as most other people. I am not above you or anybody else. I have my prejudices. I have my predilection, my preferences. But until a couple of weeks ago, until I got a book, by Robert A. Heinlein that I didn't even know existed. And that's the guy in the photo in 1944. He was a graduate of Annapolis, right? that guy, the science fiction writer. Right? I didn't know that he was indeed a patriot, an American patriot, a nationalist. He was involved at a deep, deep level on retaining sovereignty for the American people and for humanity in general, I think. He might have excluded East Asians, he hated them with a passion because of World War II and Pearl Harbor. But I think over time, he probably, his message applied to all of humanity. So what was the book that I received after, I don't know, I can't remember how I found it. It, it forced me a radical rethinking of who Robert A. Heinlein is. And I'm going to read, I'm going to reread Stranger in a Strange Land through a new lens now. But here is the book. The suspense is over, ladies and gentlemen. Here is the, I will not tease you any further. Here is the book. It's called Take Back Your Government. I'm sorry, I'm covering it up. See the author, Robert A. Heinlein. See there, that's the, that's the U.S. Constitution. Remember that? It was shredded quite a while ago, but we have uh, copies of it. And, then, and it, it's also enshrined in our soul and our heart and can never be uprooted unless we watch the Apple TV version of the foundation again. Then it'll it'll be expunged from, from our memory, from the historical memory. So this is the real Robert A. Heinlein, right? I had a Eustace Mullins Ezra Pound moment where I... I was also taught that T.S. Eliot was, a, yeah, they were all elitist, you know, they had their problems and they, you know, T.S. Eliot was Anglo-Catholic, not everybody else other than that was probably a, a, a lower life form, right? And the, his social class line, I, you know, I understand that, but I'm not going to reject them just because of their own myopia, right? I have my own myopia, so do you. But So uh, I'm not nearsighted about Robert Heinlein anymore. He wrote this book and I read through it and I said, oh my God, this is a guidebook for what we need in 2022. 
and this came out in 70 something it's it's republished it went out of print but you can get it i recommend it it was came out in 1992 it was republished in 2012 okay so um and oh i there's also one and i got one more minute i'm gonna give myself one other figure who robert campbell um did not ever bring into the fold because he was not a techno fascist, right? He accepted Asimov and all these other people. He did not accept Ray Bradbury. You know why? Because Ray Bradbury was a humanist. Yeah, he did all the little tricks and all the technological uh, wonders that people like Asimov and, and, um, Campbell himself and Heinlein, they threw that in there. But he believed in humanity. Uh, Campbell did not. He believed not in humanity in general. He believed in a technocratic or biotechnocratic elite, a dictatorship that was going to run human affairs. And that's been the wet dream of authoritarians and dictators since time immemorial. That is how to get over on the little people. Yeah, we're going to even recruit someone who's seemingly a little person like J.D. Vance, who comes from the mountains, which he didn't, and create a mythology on him and, and use him to screw over the little people. See how cool they are? They're really slick, but they're not any slicker than you or me, ladies and gentlemen. And I welcome all of you, Garden Girl, Michael Lorette. Uh, Samuel Adams, Zaga Nostra Nostra, Corky Goss, AM, good to see you, Corky, and um, all of you. I'm going to sign off here with the, with the, the, uh, the positive um, message that, hey, they can throw all the literature they want at us, all the video games, all the inhuman uh, scams, CRT, GLBTQ, and all that. They can, they can devise and engineer everything they want, but none, none of it is going to even make a dent in the human heart and our soul, our immortal soul. Yes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you on Thursday. I'm looking forward to it. God willing, I'll be with you on Thursday. Thank you very much for your attention.